everything will end. And when everything has ended, there will be judgment. We profess that. We declare that. That God will come to judge the living and the dead. How nice it is to hear, who am I to judge? How nice it is to hear, we should be compassionate, we should be merciful, we should be all-embracing, we should welcome everybody. How nice it is to hear, we should build bridges instead of walls. And we should destroy the walls of prejudice, the walls of bias, the walls of racism, so that we can live as brothers and sisters. It is good to live like that. But we must not forget that we cannot live our lives without judgment. It is not about judging the sinner and the saint. It is not about judging the good person or the bad person. It is not about judging your brothers or your sisters because only God can do that indeed. But we cannot live our lives without judgment. For example, you have to judge between what is right and what is wrong. And after making a judgment, about what is right and what is wrong, to choose what is right. For example, you have to make a choice between what is legal and what is illegal, between what is moral and what is immoral, between what is sinful and what is pleasing to God. That is a judgment call. And when we know what is right, what is holy, what is just, what is fair, what is loving, that is what we must do. For example, you're given a choice between sharing and being a glutton. If you're given a choice between being truthful and lying, if you're given a choice between bowing down humbly to serve or being an arrogant, ambitious person, the choice is clear. We must make a judgment about our own actions. And when we make a judgment about the actions of others, it is not about condemning them. It is rather about teaching what the Lord teaches. The gospel, by its very nature, is confrontational. And the Lord was confrontational with everything about religion, with everything about culture that was inconsistent with the plan of the Father for humankind. And he suffered for that. Now the question to ask is, are we ready to make judgment calls between what is right and what is wrong? Because at the end of our lives, when God comes to judge the living and the dead, but at the end of our lives, when after our soul has separated from our body and our soul has to face the judgment seat of God, the just God will be judging us according to the judgments we have made here on earth. Because if we refuse to make a judgment between good and evil, if we refuse to make a judgment between what is moral and what is immoral, in the name of welcoming, in the name of embracing, in the, name, in the name of tolerating, and in the name of inviting them to the flock, we might be missing the point. Because true love also corrects. True love calls the loved one to conversion. Because the call to conversion leads to the path of true discipleship. We cannot be a church that is called a dispenser of cheap grace. We must offer consolation. 
but our consolation must be premised on conversion. And uh, we challenge people to conversion because the gospel is confrontational with what is wrong, with what is sinful, with what is inconsistent with the kingdom of God. But when we have all discussed and confronted and wrestled with all the sins and the wrongdoings of the world, what is the last temptation that we need to face? That last temptation is to do what is right with the wrong motivation. To do what is right, to be prayerful, to serve, to give your life for others, even to allow yourself to be killed, but for the wrong motivation, but for the wrong reason. And sometimes, sometimes we indeed do many good things for the wrong reasons, not always with the right reasons. At the judgment seat of God, we will be face to face with our own selves. And uh, we don't like our loved one to get angry at us. We don't like a loved one crying because to, to allow a loved one to get angry at us or to cry because of us is actually to be lacking in love for them. So the question we ask ourselves is, what made Jesus angry? What made Jesus angry when he cleansed the temple? And what made Jesus cry when he looked at Jerusalem and uh, cried over the city? cried for the city. What made Jesus angry? What made Jesus cry? And we don't like him to cry. And we don't like him angry, especially angry at us. So what is it? The first thing that angered the Lord was the belief among the Jews that the temple is the house of God. It is really correct. The temple is the house of God. And the temple is God's temple. But that is only partially correct. Because while the temple is the house of God, we must remember that we cannot restrict the, the Lord. Because the whole universe the whole cosmos is the temple of God. And God lives outside the stone temple that men and women have built for Him. To make God an exclusive God, to make God a God who is only ours and not for the others, to make God a God who is restricted by the walls that we build, that angered the Lord. It is also what caused the Lord to cry over Jerusalem because the chosen people had claimed for themselves that they were God's favorites. And in claiming for themselves that they were God's favorites, they also judged others to be non-favorites of God, as the refuse of God, as the rejects of God as the throw away of God. But God does not throw away. God does not reject. God wants to offer salvation for all. And the third reason why the Lord was angry and the Lord teared over Jerusalem was that they did not only build the temple as an exclusive building, they also believed that God owed them something because they did something beautiful for God. And in addition to that, because they had offered something beautiful for God, 
they thought that this man-made building would last forever. All wrong. The temple is the house of God, but the whole universe belongs to God, and God dwells in the whole universe. We offer our gifts to God, but come to think of it, you cannot even expect God to thank you. Why? Because the gifts we offered to God are actually the gifts we have received from Him. There is nothing in our hands that is completely ours. And then to think that something that has been created by human beings will last forever is a big, big illusion. And like a bubble, it must burst. Because everything that our hands can build, everything that our eyes can see, everything that we can smell, even the smell of incense and fragrance, all of this will pass away because all of these are creations of God's creatures. In the end, only God is forever. God was angry and God cried because they thought everything was forever. No, not everything is forever. Only the things of God only the love of God is forever. No temple is forever. No jewelry is forever. No medal is forever. No recognition is forever. No world record is forever. Only God is. And if you want to be forever, cling to Him who is forever. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, where are you? Everything will come to an end and everything and everybody will pass the judgment seat of God. Where are you now? Are you ready to face the judge? Are you ready to make your judgments against evil and for good? And are you willing to do what is right with the right motivation for the right reason all the time. Let us not lead ourselves face to face with God who is angry, who is crying because we have been blinded by the temples we have built. We have been blinded by the achievements we have reached because we have been blinded to think that we can be forever without God. Separated from God, we are nothing. Only God is forever. And only those who believe in the Lord, eat His bread and drink His blood, eat His body and drink His blood, will live forever. My dear brothers and sisters, God is here. You know what makes him angry. You know what makes him sad. You know what made him cry over Jerusalem. You know what made him angry at the temple. You know it. Don't do it. Make a judgment call. Let us say together, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord and we will serve Him forever. That is the judgment we have placed upon ourselves. We have chosen the Lord.